so that people so that people can watch them later on YouTube. Um, I'm Connie Lee. I'm the CEO of the Alliance to Cure Cavernous Malformation, and I am very pleased to present to you this evening uh, Dr. Lanzino from Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. He and I have known each other for a very long time, um, and it's nice to be able to see him again and to greet him for the first time on one of our webinars. Um, just as a little bit of background, he specializes in endovascular and surgical treatment of patients with cerebrovascular disorders. Um, and he's the co-director, along with Dr. Kelly Fleming, who many of you know, of the CCM Center of Excellence at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Um, he's going to be talking to us tonight about surgery for intracranial cavernous malformation. So Dr. Lanzino, welcome. Thank you very much. It's um a true privilege for me to be in front of uh, um, this audience uh, and uh, share some of considerations that go into the decision making to uh, consider um, a surgery for um, cavernous malformations. I'd like to start uh, by um, thanking and uh, recognizing the incredible contribution of uh, Dr. Fleming. Um, you know her very well, and uh, we work very closely, and uh, we uh, discuss virtually every patient that uh, we consider for um, surgery. Now, um, we all like uh, uh, metrics and uh, uh, um, uh, try to uh, provide a very rigid um, algorithms. Um, but um, um, really, the decision uh, to consider surgery in a patient with the cavernous malformation, it truly a very individualized uh, uh, decision. And uh, there are so many different uh, components that uh, uh, have a very important role. And uh, I must confess that today in my practice after many years, really the decisions on when to consider surgery, especially for a cavernous malformation in the brainstem, in the thalamus, truly it's uh, so difficult that it's actually much more difficult than uh, the procedure itself. The procedure itself, you know exactly what you need to do and what to expect and what you find. But uh, the decision-making, there are so many uh, nuances. And uh, the main issue is that uh, no matter how large is your experience, you cannot uh, truly consistently anticipate what's going to be the outcome uh, in an individual uh, in an individual patient. So these are just uh, some of the factors that um, uh, play an important role, the uh, type of symptoms of presentation. Uh, the, what is the natural history, the risk uh, without surgical treatment, uh, patient characteristics, uh, comorbidities, uh, age, profession, uh, uh, degree of um, uh, family and other types of um, uh, su uh, social support. And then, of course, uh, uh, you have to balance everything with the surgical risks that, uh, as you will see, and uh, as you know, they are often related to the location, but uh, I also will stress uh, the particular type of lesion, and uh, you will see with some examples what I mean uh, um, by that. Now, when I'm faced with the patient, uh, truly, um, and I'm considering surgery, the first question I'm asking myself is that, uh, can I improve this patient life with the surgical intervention? If the answer is yes, uh, for example, in a patient who presents with uh, uh, refractory uh, seizures, um, then the decision is much easier. But uh, if the answer is, uh, well, I can remove the lesion, I can remove the risk of bleeding, but I really cannot truly improve uh, the current status of this patient, then you really need to be very careful 
and uh, you have to ponder every single component of your decision and recommendation. Now, let's consider uh, uh, some of the symptoms that are most commonly seen with the cavernous malformation. So, um, this is a case example, 19-year-old uh, college student uh, um, um, presents with uh, multiple recurrent uh, seizures, started on seizure medications, uh, and you can see here you see the cavernous uh, malformation, and uh, despite uh, fairly aggressive medical therapy continues to have uh, um, seizures. Now, um, here, uh, of course, a uh, um, patient like this is definitely an excellent candidate for surgery. And then uh, once you consider surgery, then you look at the lesion, the location, and uh, you try to uh, predict what the potential risks are. Now, um, with cavernous malformations over the past really 40 years, we have made incredible improvement uh, in terms of how we think about our surgeries. A lesion like this uh, uh, could um, apparently be located in a deep location, but uh, if you um, look carefully at the lesion, uh, you notice that uh, it comes uh, very close to the surface here. This is the cerebellum and this is the mid portion of the um, temporal, uh, medial temporal lobe. And uh, particularly in the coronal section, this is uh, what we call the tentorium. And uh, basically there is a narrow space there and uh, between uh, the, what we call the supratentorial compartment and the infratentorial compartment is divided by the dura of the tentorium. And as hard as it might um, be to imagine, we really, uh, with the proper neurosurgical techniques, uh, using this uh, narrow but uh, 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 anatomical spaces, we really can uh, reach uh, these lesions by lesion by going behind the ear with the small incision and uh, really. Uh, following that narrow space uh, to remove these lesions without literally um, uh, touching the brain. So in a patient who is having recurrent seizures despite medications and uh, the lesion can be easily uh, reached uh, with uh, microsurgical technique, then uh, uh, the, there is a very good uh, indication for surgery plus a very uh, young uh, patient. And um, when we consider uh, surgery for uh, cavernous malformations that uh, are causing seizures, there are two main uh, techniques. One is the so-called uh, lesionectomy in the sense that uh, you just remove the lesion and you can uh, see it. And then there is another technique that usually applies to patients that have had the seizure for a long period of time or seizures particularly localized in highly epileptogenic areas like the temporal lobe where if the location of the uh, cavernous malformation allows it. You can do remove the lesion, but in addition to removing the lesion, you can also remove some of the surrounding uh, um, immosiderin stained uh, parenchyma in order to give that patient the highest chance of being a seizure free after the surgery. So in this patient, uh, you can see here, this is the uh, position at surgery. We call it the semi-sitting position because the patient is literally sitting up on the surgical table. You can see the incision um, uh, with uh, sparing, uh, um, um, without uh, shaving too much hair. And uh, as I said, we follow this anatomical space uh, uh, that is uh, um, the uh, tentorium and uh, um, basically going uh, from uh, below, you can see this is uh, the preoperative and this is the postoperative. The lesion has been removed, but you see better here uh, 
how this is before the surgery and this is after the surgery. You see the whole left from uh, removing the lesion and you can see that the surrounding brain, it's perfectly untouched because we have followed this uh, natural anatomical space. And uh, this patient, the last follow up was a couple of years ago. He's originally from Nepal and has been uh, seizure free since and has completed um, college. So in a patient who present with seizures, then uh, we can uh, confidently say that the surgery is often, but not always, but it's often uh, very effective in uh, decreasing the need of uh, anticonvulsant medications and uh, uh, the dosage after surgery. And uh, potentially after a, a period of time uh, variable between one and two years, then uh, a patient who has been seizure free after surgery, you can even consider complete discontinuation of the anticonvulsants. So we recommend surgery in patients that have uh, seizures that are not responding to medications. Patients who have had just uh, one seizure but uh, they start medications and they have side effects. And then uh, if the location of the lesion is such that you can remove it with a very low risk, then uh, um, it's reasonable, in my opinion, to recommend surgery, especially in a young patient who has had a single seizure. The seizures are well controlled with medications, but of course, that's a decision that uh, you have to um, take with the patients. Um, um, Anticonvulsants and medical treatment without surgery, it's a very reasonable um, uh, option. But if the patient prefers surgery with the idea that eventually this patient can come off seizure medications is uh, a reasonable option if the lesion is uh, easily um, accessible. Then uh, there is uh, the other common presentation that is um, hemorrhage. And uh, this is a young lady who presented uh, really with the, a cluster of different uh, bleeding episodes. This was in the height of the COVID pandemic. And as a matter of fact, when she first presented, she also um, tested positive for uh, COVID. And uh, here you can see a very complex cavernous malformation. And when I look at an MRI, I consider what is what I called in quote and quote, quote, the active portion of the cavernous malformation, which is the part that is causing the bleed. And then you can see that this is uh, acute subacute blood and um, this is very important from a surgical point of view because the presence i always tell my patients paradoxically the presence of uh, acute or subacute uh, uh, blood really you can see that uh, provides uh, a buffer almost all around this cavernous malformation that is in a very delicate area so that once you reach the cavernous malformation and uh, you remove uh, some of the liquid uh, blood components, then you can start working uh, around uh, the true cavernous malformation and therefore the presence of subacute blood, the blood that has been there for a few weeks, uh, in many cases uh, um, facilitates uh, the surgical removal of the cavernous malformation. So in this patient, you can see really the extent of the uh, cavernous malformation with the associated uh, uh, bleeding. So in this case, um, the indication to consider surgery was related to the uh, presence of multiple bleeds, but also you can see, even though the cavernous malformation, it's literally, as you can see on this uh, sagittal MRI, literally in the middle of this patient brain in the thalamus and the hypothalamus and in the um, uh, cere uh, cerebral peduncle, you can see that just going uh, in between uh, the two sides, the two brain hemispheres, the two sides of the brains, we can go 
through the corpus callosum, which is uh, this area here that uh, often tolerates, especially in the more anterior portion, a small opening. And then uh, this is the ventricle, and you will be just looking at the cavernous malformation. So despite uh, the deep location, using uh, some of the anatomical corridors that are present, you can reach the cavernous malformation literally uh, without touching the brain and only incising a very small portion of uh, the corpus callosum. So here uh, uh, we use uh, a few uh, practical tricks. As Dr. Spetzler uh, taught us many years ago. Uh, it's very important to consider not only the location, but also you like to have uh, a preferential and ideal point of view to the um, cavernous malformation. And sometimes it's uh, better to go from uh, the opposite side so that you have that uh, preferential point, direct point of view looking uh, directly into the cavernous malformation. And you can see here, um, using some tricks of positions and gravity, you can uh, open uh, those natural uh, spaces in between the two sides of the brain to reach the cavernous malformation that in this patient is located in the in this region of the thalamus and the hypothalamus. You can see here is the patient is positioned on the um, uh, with the head turned all the way parallel to the floor. And um, I will show you some uh, portions of the video to illustrate. Here we have exposed uh, the brain. We are right in the middle of the, um, in between the two sides. And you can see that uh, we have opened what's called the interhemispheric fissure. It's that uh, natural anatomical plane that divides the two uh, hemispheres. And now here is this uh, white structure is the corpus callosum. So we are opening the corpus callosum and we are looking right at the surface of the thalamus. And you can see that it's a little bit discolored because of the cavernous malformation. And then oh, sorry, what um, we do here, we uh, confirm that uh, we are where we are supposed to be using uh, neuronavigation and we have uh, neuronavigation that is synchronized with the microscope that is telling us, yes, you are where you are supposed to be. You are right on the top of the cavernous malformation. So we can confidently then uh, um, uh, make a small uh, incision and uh, start removing that liquefied portion of the cavernous malformation. And when you have this large cavernous malformation, especially when there is what we call a subacute blood. So the last bleeding has occurred two to three weeks before the surgery. As you remove the liquefied portion of the blood, the pressure of the brain that has been displaced, that pressure as you work will continue to, in a way, to squeeze the cavernous malformations into your opening. As you can see here, we're working through the microscope, a small opening, large portion of the cavernous malformation has been removed. And now we are working on the last bits of the cavernous malformation until what you see is this uh, discolored uh, uh, yellowish, that's the normal, uh, normal tissue at the boundaries of the cavernous uh, malformation. And therefore using all these principles principles and these tricks and uh, using also the timing uh, in relation to the last bleed uh, to your advantage, you can work and remove very large cavernous malformations through a very uh, small uh, opening. And you can see here on the left is the preoperative uh, picture, on the right is the postoperative uh, uh, picture and uh, utilizing uh, the approach from the control lateral side, you have a preferential point of view that allows you to remove even uh, the more lateral extension of the liquefied portion of the hematoma.
And uh, this patient had an excellent um, outcome and uh, three months later at uh, the uh, slightest um, uh, right-sided uh, residual uh, weakness. So when we have a cavernous malformation that has presented with hemorrhage, then we know that uh, presentation with hemorrhage is the strongest predictor for the risk of uh, another bleed in the future. Therefore, when we are faced with the cavernous malformation that has hemorrhage, then uh, we would consider surgery based on, of course, uh, the, the risk of the surgery has to be balanced with the, what we call the natural history of cavernous malformations. Because if it's true that after a single bleeding, the risk of additional bleeds in the future, it's uh, fairly significant. It's also true that uh, the blood that flows through a cavernous malformation, it's under very low pressure. And therefore, when there is a bleed from a cavernous malformation, the surrounding tissue is displaced uh, rather than destroyed. And that's the reason why many patients with cavernous malformations after a single bleed, but sometimes even after two or three or even four bleeds, they can uh, uh, recover some of the function that is affected uh, with, uh, with um, each bleed. So hemorrhagic cavernous malformation, there are, of course, you can see a lot of nuances. It's not automatic that uh, we would consider surgery. But we would consider based on the location, the surgical risk, the symptoms, patient preference, uh, age, comorbidities, and some of the other uh, factors that uh, I have indicated before. So you can see how that decision making, it's really not uh, so uh, straightforward uh, in a large number of, um, of patients. Then uh, um, today, uh, since it's very common to get a CAT scan or an MRI uh, for many reasons that are not necessarily, like in this patient, related to the cavernous malformation, we come across what we call incidental lesions, basically lesions, cavernous malformations that um, we found by accident. And uh, in these patients, we prefer to recommend observation because the vast majority of these patients, they have a very benign uh, natural history without, um, uh, without surgery. Now, um, we uh, go now into uh, briefly into some uh, general considerations uh, when uh, we consider surgery, for example, for uh, brainstem cavernous malformations. So what are, um, looking at the lesion, looking at the MRI, what are the considerations that go through our mind? Well, first of all, we try to establish that part of the cavernous malformation that comes closest to a surface. Why? Because with modern uh, surgical approaches, we can reach uh, safely pretty much any surface um, in the, um, outside the brain, of course, but also inside uh, uh, in the deepest portions of the brain, as long as uh, the lesion comes closest uh, to uh, that particular surface, as you saw in that um, patient with the thalamic cavernous malformation, the lesion came pretty much to the surface of the thalamus inside the ventricle. And that made all the difference and we were able to uh, remove that lesion without uh, damage, without the need to traversing uh, any of the normal uh, brain. Then uh, once we have identified the portion, uh, the, we have studied uh, the cavernous malformation, then uh, it's not only that portion that comes closest to a surface, but we also have to consider what is the ideal trajectory to improve visualization and uh, uh, make the recession uh, easier, especially in relation to what uh, we 
consider and we can anticipate to be the most difficult uh, portion of that um, uh, lesions. When we consider brainstem uh, in you know the typical uh, classical uh, division subdivision of the brainstem is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. But the issue is that uh, many cavernous malformations they are not confined to one single brainstem uh, subcompartment. They often uh, run across different of these uh, different compartments, and that's something that um, you have to keep uh, in mind in your uh, uh, decision making. Now, the other thing that uh, I, for example, in a patient who has had uh, two or three uh, bleeds where the lesion has grown a lot, it's very helpful to have the original MRI at presentation after the first bleed, because that MRI gives us um, a sense of where the actual cavernous malformations, what I call the active part, really started, because that's the area where more likely than not, the cavernous malformation is going to be more attached to the surrounding brain. Another question that uh, we all, an issue that we always uh, debate um, among uh, experts and uh, a question that uh, we are often asked by patients, after a, a bleed, after a new hemorrhage, what is the ideal, the best time to do surgery? Of course, if you, are, if you have decided to go ahead and do surgery, and the only reason you're doing surgery, the main reason in a patient with the hemorrhage is to prevent a more hemorrhage. So ideally, the sooner you do the surgery, the better. The problem is that it's not that, it's not that simple, the decision, because you have to balance that with the risk that especially if you operate too soon after a new hemorrhage, especially in deep areas like the thalamus, the brainstem, you can also run the risk of causing additional uh, um, damage. Why? Because um, when you have a fresh bleed, often uh, the surrounding brain responds, it's un sudden, there is sudden compression. And because of the presence of blood, the surrounding brain responds with uh, some edema, some swelling. And uh, the swelling changes the consistency of the brain. That if we um, uh, com consider the brain as uh, a uh, jello like structure, the presence of edema, which is nothing that water within uh, the normal brain tissue, the presence of edema of swelling makes uh, that jello even softer. And therefore, if you go, within the brain that is uh, um, swollen and try to remove a cavernous malformation, you are likely to cause damage of that uh, surrounding uh, brain that has been softened by the presence of uh, water, by the presence of what medically we call uh, edema. So that's, that is one of the main reasons why, especially in highly eloquent areas, if possible, it's probably better to wait two, three weeks for that uh, edema to subside so that uh, the surrounding brain, the surrounding parenchyma is more, uh, it's uh, stronger and can withstand, better withstand uh, the mechanical manipulation related to the physical removal of the cavernous malformation. Now, Another consideration uh, is that um, you have to be very careful uh, uh, when planning your surgery on MRI, because um, as I said before, blood flowing through cavernous malformations is under very low pressure. When there is a bleed, that bleeding uh, often displaces more than completely destroying the surrounding tissue. And therefore the brain around especially a fresh bleed or a large cavernous malformation, it's uh, pushed on the side and uh, 
can be can appear very thin or not even present. Like for example, in this case, we're looking at the cavernous malformation. There is a large hemorrhage. And uh, it looks like this area here that we define uh, the floor of the fourth ventricle, one of the most uh, complex areas that we normally deal with. But here it looks like it's completely, has been completely transgressed by the hemorrhage. But after you do surgery and you remove the cavernous malformation and the uh, uh, hemorrhage, look what happens. You see that uh, actually there was a fairly thick, uh, fairly thick uh, tissue behind this cavernous malformation right at the level of the floor of the fourth ventricle. And that's the reason why unless um, there is a uh, certain proof that uh, the cavernous malformation has gone through, we try as much as possible to um, avoid this, uh, uh, this area. So that's uh, something that um, um, it's, the MRI can be uh, really misleading uh, and that uh, is something that you have to consider when you make the decision to do surgery. And when you decide to do surgery and when you try to understand what is the best way to, um, to get there. We talked about the edema in the acute phase. And um, um, now uh, this, um, as I said before, one of the main considerations, at least for me, is that um, what type of cavernous malformations we're dealing with. Uh, there is one type that um, we can generically indicate as a hemorrhagic cavernous malformation, like this one, where the bulk of the lesion is constituted by blood of different ages. And then there is a small portion that is the cavernous malformation itself. When you operate with, on these cavernous malformations, uh, there is pressure from uh, the large hemorrhagic component. As I said before, the presence of hemorrhage, which is basically liquefied blood, helps with the surgery because once you get there and you poke a small hole, a large portion of that uh, liquefied blood that comes out through the hole and therefore it uh, allows you, it creates a natural cavity uh, through which you can uh, more safely uh, work and remove the remaining portion of the cavernous malformation that often has been displaced off uh, to the uh, side. These patients, they are actually, they can get better after, uh, after surgery when there is this uh, hemorrhagic uh, uh, type. And uh, we have had cases even here where um, most of the cavernous malformation is nothing but uh, semi-organized uh, fresh blood. And uh, if you are, you know, we use a suction device, sometimes the cavernous malformation itself is so small that might get, um, um, you know, might get lost in the suction. And the pathologist might have a hard time in some of these to actually find the active in the real cavernous uh, malformation. Then there is another type that um, I uh, call it the non-hemorrhagic type, like in this uh, young lady that had this cavernous malformation. And you can see also on the MRI, the cavernous malformation is nothing but uh, the um, uh, uh, D different uh, um, small uh, uh, areas uh, filled with cavities filled with blood. And these cavernous malformations, they often grow not with the frank large hemorrhage like some of the ones we have seen, but they grow very slowly through microproliferation of these structures that we call caverns. These cavernous malformations, they have been often long-standing. They are very established. And as you can see, they have a very thick and a very well-established rim um, of um, 
uh, that is really stuck uh, to the surrounding uh, parenchyma. And these ones uh, can be in the brainstem, in the thalamus, they can be extremely difficult to uh, remove. Uh, and these are patients that often, if you remove uh, the lesion completely, these are patients that often can be worse uh, after, uh, after surgery. So as I said, that this is, uh, um, and especially if you are working through narrow corridors, you can remove a successfully and safely a cavernous malformation with the large hemorrhagic component. But if you have a small corridor, this particular type, it's really very, very um, challenging. Here is the example after we expose the brain in this uh, particular case, uh, again, uh, we are here in the back of the, this is the cerebellum. So we are operating with the patient, uh, what we call in the prone position, face down. So we make an incision in the back of the brain. And uh, once we uh, displace the, gently the cerebellum, we have a natural uh, venue that uh, takes us uh, to the um, to the cavernous uh, malformation. So in this particular case, despite uh, the more established cavernous malformations, we were able to resect it safely enough because we were able to access, given the location, and have a fairly large corridor, a fairly, fairly large opening through which uh, we uh, were able to work under uh, the uh, microscope. And uh, this is the post-operative uh, uh, MRI, and you can see the hole left after complete removal of the cavernous malformation. This is another example. Uh, quickly, is a patient with the um, um, thalamo uh, pedoncular uh, cavernous malformation. And, but you can see there is a fairly large uh, uh, hemorrhagic component. And um, um, here, uh, again, uh, like in the first case I show you, we can uh, go through this uh, um, uh, trajectory following uh, the so-called uh, uh, tentorium. And uh, we know that having the cavernous malformation, a very large hemorrhagic component, once we get uh, uh, there, we can just uh, make a small opening and through that opening, uh, remove a the liquefied portion of the relatively fresh blood. And then we are left with the cavity, with the hole um, that we, um, through which we can remove the actual portion of the cavernous malformation, what I call the active part, that in this particular patient is probably this part here displaced all the way off uh, to the uh, periphery. And you can see this is the surgical trajectory. And again, uh, this is an artist rendering of uh, this particular type of uh, approach. And uh, um, here, the plan is to get here uh, using one of those natural planes. This is called, it's called the lateral mesencephalic sulcus. And then once you are there, there is a very thin uh, margin of uh, parenchyma that we can safely traverse to reach the cavernous malformation. And once you have exposed, this is what you see. You see the surface of the brainstem. Yes, it appears uh, a little bit yellowish, brownish, but there is no frank cavernous malformation that you can see on the surface. And again, here it's very important and uh, reassuring to have that immediate feedback of the neuronavigation that is telling you, yes, you are exactly where you think you are and you are right on the surface of the, this cavernous malformation. This is the incision, uh, and uh, we were able to remove this cavernous malformation. And here you can see it's the very small opening through the lateral surface of the midbrain that we had to traverse uh, to get to this um, uh, deep uh, cavernous malformation. And you can see here the preoperative MRI 
in the post-operative uh, MRI. And again, you can see the small opening that you had to create in order to reach this particular cavernous malformation. And here on the coronal picture, we're looking at the patient from behind. You can see the patient ears. We were able to go through this uh, natural corridor um, in between the supratentorial and the infratentorial portion of the brain, follow this natural small corridor, open it with the microsurgical technique and uh, reach this portion of the cavernous malformation, really without uh, violating, without touching the surrounding brain. Before we conclude, uh, um, a few words on uh, uh, spinal cavernous malformations, because these cavernous malformations, they often come to the surface, either uh, on the posterior aspect or more commonly on the lateral aspect of the spinal cord. And um, the spinal cord, uh, you can uh, um, expose uh, a, a fairly um, the posterior as well as the lateral portion of the uh, spinal cord and therefore the spinal cord cavernous malformation except those few that are truly placed anteriorly if symptomatic can usually be removed uh, uh, quite safely. This is an example of a patient that uh, presented with uh, some pain and then developed numbness uh, at first uh, we didn't, um, uh, no surgery was um, considered, but as the symptoms progressed, uh, we consider surgery. And I must say that for spinal cord cavernous malformations, I think it is reasonable to consider surgery if the cavernous malformation it's, uh, comes to the posterior or to the lateral surface of the spinal cord uh, um, after uh, uh, these cavernous malformations. They become, uh, uh, they become symptomatic. So here, this is the preoperative MRI, and you can see here the cavernous malformation. There is some staining from a slow ooze of uh, chronic uh, uh, blood. And uh, quickly, a video to show now we have operated. We have removed uh, the bony part of the spine. We have uh, opened the dura. And uh, we're looking at the back of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is surrounded by what we call the arachnoid. We make an incision in the arachnoid and the, in the subarachnoid space, there is cerebrospinal fluid. We open, uh, enlarge the opening um, in the arachnoid and uh, fixate the arachnoid to the dura tented and then you can see the spinal cord and you can see the cavernous malformation which comes uh, to the dorsal surface uh, of the uh, spinal cord and uh, after releasing uh, this uh, arachnoid band uh, this is an electrode that allows us to monitor what's called the delta wave basically it allows us to monitor the patient uh, motor function and here now you will see we incise the surface of the spinal cord. And as you can see, as soon as we open, uh, you'll see that there is uh, subacute blood that comes out. And uh, as you continue to remove and to partially empty uh, some of the uh, subacute blood, then you are able to develop a plane and um, under the microscope high magnification start uh, going uh, all around and eventually remove completely this lesion and uh, here is the post-operative MRI and you can see here that uh, there is uh, a uh, fluid filled uh, cavity where the cavernous malformations uh, was and here is uh, the sagittal post-operative uh, MRI. I'll uh, stop here. Uh, thank you for um, your uh, attention. Again, uh, it's a great privilege for me to be in front of this uh, audience. I always uh, um, uh, stand by the incredible courage of um, our uh, uh, patients. And uh, it's uh, really one of those, uh, uh, the courage of the patients and uh, the strength the patients, their family, what they go through is really what pushes us every day to uh, get uh, uh, better and better.
and of course I'm happy to answer any question and I'll uh, stop sharing my screen so that. Uh... Yeah, thank you for an incredibly fascinating uh, presentation. This is, I've learned a ton just over the last 40 minutes. Um, I, I have a, a personal question and then I'll, I'll move over to the questions in the Q&A. So we have now a network of 12 centers of excellence and they all have expert surgeons. So I'm trying to just gauge what is it that a patient should be taking into consideration as they're trying to make choices about where to go to have their surgery or the are there certain things they should be looking for? Is there something outside of just the surgeon? What what would make you choose one place or another over another? Well, I I think it's um, um, important, uh, especially when we are dealing with the lesions that are both complex and relatively uncommon, to uh, be in a center uh, that has a expertise and um, uh, where a large number of patients are seen. I think that it's also very important, you know, the surgery, often there is a lot of stress on the surgery itself. But as I said, the nowadays in my experience, the decision on when to do surgery, who is the right patient, when to do the surgery, especially after a presenting bleed, as become really the most complex part, portion of the entire uh, experience. And therefore, to have a center where you have uh, expertise in all the other fields that we depend upon, particularly neurology, uh, neurophysiology, uh, imaging, uh, uh, it, I think it's, it, it helps uh, a lot. Um, we, I, of course, we deal a lot with patients that are seeking uh, multiple opinions and they ask me, well, where should I have my surgery? And I say, well, I think you're doing the right thing when you have the option to seek multiple opinions. And then my recommendation is that once you seek multiple opinions, you go with the person that you feel more comfortable with. And I think it's important to establish that personal relationship of you know mutual uh mutual trust i think that's a, a very important aspect i agree i agree okay let me let me get to other people's questions a few people have asked about imaging techniques prior to surgery what imaging techniques do you recommend do you uh, when would you do a functional mri or any of the other types of imaging that that uh would map out where functions are yeah, um, you know, the imaging is, um, I view uh, as uh, uh, technology. And uh, technology, when it's available, it, it uh, always helps. Um, when uh, we deal with cavernous malformation, I would say, for example, if a cavernous malformation comes to the surface and uh, or very close, and you know that you are close to speech areas, um, of course, it helps to have uh, a functional MRI, but based on uh, anatomy and often patient symptoms, you know very well that you are gonna be in or very close to the speech areas. And if the lesion is uh, close to the uh, surface or you can reach through a sulcus, then the strategy, I tell patients, my strategy is to go inside the lesion and work inside the lesion, knowing that the surrounding brain is very important. So I think the functional MRI helps, but it, it it's sometimes I feel it's used a little bit too much because you can predict the function based on the patient symptoms and the location. Um, tractography is different. To know how the tracts have been displaced uh, by the cavernous malformation and uh, uh, to be able to identify your entry and your trajectory based on uh, where some of the important tracks have been displaced, that that can be quite uh, useful. At the same time, uh, these modern techniques, uh, tractography in particular, they are not 
perfect. So it's always a combination of multiple factors. But when you have the technology, to, like the neuro navigation, to have that extra help, that extra degree of information, it's uh, it's it's positive. So I would say I would use um, uh, tractography for uh, deep seated cavernous malformations where you try to understand how the tracks might be displaced and decide your um, um, your trajectory. Excellent. Okay. We have a few people who are asking about COVID. Um, the questions are, ha is, ha do you know whether COVID is related to hemorrhage? Do you know whether uh, the vaccines cause more hemorrhage? Have you had an increase in surgeries since the pandemic as perhaps a result of COVID? And this came up because you mentioned that one of the, the patients that you presented yeah. with a COVID diagnosis and hemorrhage at the same yeah, time. Yeah, but the, the, yes. Uh, well, uh, it, it, I will say that uh, we. the short answer is that we don't know. And uh, um, COVID has been uh, so prevalent uh, that uh, um, then naturally you have some patients that have had the hemorrhage or they became symptomatic uh, shortly after uh, uh, being infected with COVID or after receiving the vaccine. But to establish a direct causal relationship, it's very difficult and we don't know. But... I think I can say with confidence that we have not seen such a dramatic increase in the number of symptomatic patients during that period of time to be able to say, yes, there is a correlation. So I, I, we don't know. We just don't know, yeah. Okay, um, here's a philosophical question. What is the most limiting factor to your operations that you wish was a more advanced technology or technique? What would you like to see in the future? Oh, uh, I think the most limiting factor is the crystal ball. I <laughs> wish I had the crystal ball to know exactly how a specific patient would fare after surgery would be. Uh, so, no, um, I, I, I think that... Uh, um, um, the, the, there are uh, uh, improvements that uh, will come, uh, but uh, I suspect that most of the improvements that will come in the next 10, 20 years will be in the better understanding of the disease. And as we better understand the disease, we will be able to devise better treatments that hopefully soon will not be surgical treatment. So I think most of the advances, uh, and I am convinced, and uh, we discuss this constantly with Dr. Fleming, that we have made enormous improvements, but we still know very little about these lesions, why they form in certain patients, why at one point they bleed, and what can we do to prevent the bleeding? And what we can do, the other thing is that there will be, I think, uh, improvements in imaging, where we'll be able to better predict who is at high risk for hemorrhage and who is at lower risk for hemorrhage. And therefore, but that also, it's largely part under the umbrella of a better understanding of the disease. I think that will make a lot of, we will make a lot of progress and that uh, will translate in um, better outcomes. From, from your lips, <laughs> yeah, I really hope so. Um, so someone says, I am just learning about cavernous malformations. How would I know if I'm having a hemorrhage? Would it be a seizure or are there other symptoms I should be aware of? Um, it, it's, um, it is strongly dependent on the location. Um, I often been asked by patients, well, um, do I need an MRI? Well, I, it, if, a, if a cavernous malformation is in the brainstem, thalamus or in the spinal cord, I tell patients more likely than not, if you have a bleed, you will know even before the MRI. 
in other locations, um, sometimes, as I said, the, likely the bleeding from a cavernous malformation is not like a bleeding from an aneurysm or an AVM. There are some locations that we call silent or less eloquent where patients can have a bleed and they don't even realize. So um, I would say any unusual symptom that uh, lasts uh, for several days that in, especially in a patient with the known cavernous malformation is something uh, that would uh, or should trigger an imaging studies. In a completely asymptomatic patient with no history of cavernous malformation, then I don't think that there is a strong evidence unless there is a family history to go and look for. Uh, what are your thoughts or experiences with stereotactic radio surgery as a treatment? And in this case, the person is asking specifically for a hemorrhagic cavernous malformation in the thalamus. That is a, a very, um, very good question. And um, I would say that uh, traditionally stereotactic radio surgery, when we started um, in the 90s, um, we didn't have great results, but uh, more recently, um, we, with the better understanding, better planning, better imaging, um, the uh, results are um, encouraging. There is uh, always uh, um, that um, uh, debate, uh, does the uh, radiosurgery truly changes the natural history? Um, I would say that uh, uh, personally, I have um, I have an open mind uh, toward the radio surgery. We have a very active radio surgery program uh, here at uh, uh, Mayo. Um, it's uh, it's really one of the those tools that uh, nowadays you need to uh, keep in mind, that especially for a thalamic cavernous malformation, where you. Um, anticipate that your surgical risk is significant, um, then uh, it's something that uh, should be um, considered um, and um, uh, seems to be able after a lag time to uh, reduce the risk of future bleeds. Okay. Um, I, I, I wanna pause for a moment and say, we're coming near the top of the hour. There is a support group that typically starts at eight o'clock or at the top of the hour, wherever you are. Um, Dr. Lanzino has said that he would be happy to stay past the time. Um, we, we will start the support group just in case there are people who are wandering in who haven't been here. Um, so you, if you want to, you can go there. Or if you want to stay here and listen to Dr. Lanzino for a few more minutes, you also are welcome to do that. However, before everybody goes and leaves and goes all different directions, I just want to tell you, I normally don't talk about fundraising during these, these meetings, but we have received from a very generous donor a match challenge. Um, we have a $25,000 challenge that goes toward, um, that will match any donations from new donors. If you've never donated before, this is the time to do it because your whatever dollar you contribute will be worth $2.00. Or if you already are a donor and you set up a recurring donation, so a monthly donation of whatever amount, that first month will get matched. So please go to our website. There's a donate button on pretty much every page. You can click that and, and make a donation. And again, it, it helps us to move this field forward as we're in a new age now of giving grants and research grants and um, Every donation that's coming in through the end of the year is going to go directly into research grants. So you know that we'll be using it well. All right. Um, and if you want to go to support group, the link is in the chat. Darla's been taking care of that. It's, it's in there. Back to you. Um, one of my sisters has a cavernous malformation in her corpus callosum. She's been told that it's inoperable. Are there different areas of the corpus callosum that are more risky on which to operate than others? Um, uh, yes, there are uh, some areas, basically, uh, simply uh, speaking, the corpus callosum, the more you move posteriorly, the higher the risk of uh, um, 
uh, having consequences from uh, operating in the corpus callosum. The other uh, um, issue is that, as I say, as much as we like to confine these cavernous malformations to a specific anatomical location, often they span different anatomic compartments. So it is possible that uh, the bulk of the lesion is in the corpus callosum and uh, uh, there is a portion that extends in other adjacent uh, um, highly eloquent areas, which makes surgery um, uh, at higher risk. Okay. Um, how often do you see patients develop neuropathic pain after brainstem surgery? And do you think that the pain is permanent? Um, I would say, um, likely not too often but uh, that would be um, a little bit uh, um, misleading in the sense that uh, neuropathic pain is one of the most feared complications that we can encounter and therefore based on the location of the cavernous malformation patient symptoms we tend uh, to try to avoid uh, surgery where we suspect that the surgery uh, could result in uh, neuropathic pain. Um, permanent, it's, um, um, it, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, how difficult uh, the treatment uh, and uh, uh, how uh, terrible is for the patient their um, um, uh, neuropathic pain, but um, um, there are definitely pharmacological interventions and uh, uh, with time, sometimes the pain becomes more uh, um, tolerable in uh, some individuals than others. Definitely any degree of de new deficit after surgery, almost always, uh, tends to improve, especially in those first three to six months. So to say permanent, I would say, um, no, it's not always uh, uh, permanent, but uh, a, it is a, a, a big problem and it's definitely one of the most feared complications. And, and so everyone knows next month, our webinar will be about pain. Um, so join us then at the end of January. Um, how do you decide whether to remove brain tissue surrounding the malformation? Um, and is there testing that you can do to make sure that, that you're not doing anything? Um, it, uh, you can, as I said, uh, uh, based on uh, you, sh from my practical experience, really the anatomical knowledge, it's often uh, uh, the most important uh, uh, factor. Um, there are areas where you can uh, remove uh, a good amount of surrounding uh, brain uh, with impunity, and there are other areas where you have to be more careful. The situations where I would uh, consider is when you are dealing with patients with seizures, especially if the seizures have been longstanding or if the cavernous malformation is in an area where you can remove some surrounding brain with impunity. If you are planning to consider removal of surrounding brain, then uh, functional MRI or intraoperative mapping, or in some situations, even um, um, a wake surgery, even though for cavernous malformation, it's very uh, rare that we consider a wake surgery. Those are useful tools that allow you to um, navigate the fine line between uh, how much you can remove and the risk of deficits. Can a cavernoma in the right temporal subinsular region be removed? Um, you know, every cavernous malformation can be removed. Uh, the key is always to understand what are uh, the risks versus uh, uh, benefits. Um, for an insular cavernous malformation, I think one of the main issues is uh, how close the um, 
cavernous malformation comes to the uh, side of the insula that is uh, contained within the sylvian fissure because you might have a cavernous malformation that comes to close to the surface um, that you can safely remove even on the left side that it's usually the dominant side um, through a uh, through the uh, opening uh, widely the spaces uh, uh, of the sylvian fissure almost likely unfolding that area so that uh, the insula comes to the surface so the the short answer is yes but again, it's it always depends. Difficult without knowing a lot of specifics and uh, looking at the images. Of course, if it comes close, on um, it's on the deeper side and it goes uh, close to the internal capsule, then the risks are not insignificant. Um, another imaging question: When you see a patient with with brain CCMs, do you automatically order a spinal spinal imaging as well, or are there certain circumstances in, under which you would order it? I think we would um, um, consider it um, in the um, familial form. Uh, when it comes to imaging um, um, of uh, asymptomatic lesions, I tend to have as much as possible a practical approach because it has been my experience that uh, sometimes it's better not knowing about cavernous malformation in the spine, especially if uh, you do an imaging study and then you say, well, there are multiple cavernous malformations, but the recommendation is to observe. So I think it's some patients prefer to know, and that's fine. But I would say the situation where we probably would consider is in the familial form, because you know that there is a high likelihood. Vice versa, though, when uh, we have a patient with the spinal cavernous malformation, since we know that um, uh, many patients with spinal cavernous malformations have supratentorial cavernous malformations in the brain. In that case, we would consider, because of course, it's always nice to have a baseline uh, and then you can, it makes a follow-up uh, easier. Okay. Um, do you have any idea where the best place in Australia is for this type of surgery? Jeffrey is writing in from Australia. Well, uh, um, I would say that um, the, in um, Australia, there are uh, uh, several good uh, centers and the organization of health care in Australia is such that uh, uh, each one of the academic centers, because the way the territory is subdivided, um, they have um, large experience with um, uh, uncommon lesions, including cavernous malformation. So I'm um, in any of the larger centers, there are good surgeons. Very diplomatic, thank you. Um, an easy question, is the temporal lobe more surgically difficult? Um, the temporal lobe, I would, not, I would say it's not more surgically difficult. But in a patient uh, that presents with the seizure, if the cavernous malformation is located in the temporal lobe, then uh, um, uh, removing just the cavernous malformation might not provide uh, a degree of success that is as high as a cavernous malformation that presents with seizure but it's located in other regions of the brain other than the temporal lobe. So I would say it's not uh, a um, major, of course, uh, there are some areas that are uh, more difficult than are others, but it's not a difficult area per se from a surgical perspective, but in a patient with seizures, a temporal lobe location has implications that uh, uh, often warrant uh, a true, what we call a seizure type of workup. There's a couple of questions that I'm going to answer. One of them is, do we have any results from the atorvastatin trial yet? And the answer to that is no, not yet. We, we're still waiting. There's still people that are taking the medicine. So it's going to be a little while before we know how that one turns out. 
Someone else has asked, is there a place where I can find out more about genetic CCM? Yes, our website. We have an entire section on genetics, and there's also a 90-minute um, webinar that I did um, last year sometime. Um, and then last question, what about uh, the difficulty of a deep parietal lobe lesion? Is there is there an easier way to do a deep parietal lobe than just going straight in? Well, uh, uh, it's, um, um, you know, there are uh, newer uh, um, technologies that are being uh, um, uh, carefully uh, utilize in some patients with cavernous malformations for those lesions that are more uh, um, uh, difficult or riskier to be removed uh, uh, surgically. But um, I would say that um, short of surgery or uh, um, um, usually many temporal uh, parietal lobe lesions can be accessed uh, with uh, surgery. And sometimes the lesion can be, um, can look deeper on uh, an MRI, but if you study carefully, there is often a sulcus that you can follow and it's gonna take you very close to that lesion. So again, without knowing the specifics of clinical presentations and imaging and patient characteristic is very difficult to provide a, definitive answer to that question. Okay. Um, that ends the questions in the Q&A. We have in the chat right now, a ton of people saying thank you um, to thank you, you. For, for answering questions for the presentation. It's been, it truly has been eye-opening in many ways. Um, I learned, someone just said, I learned several things that will help with my decisions. Thank you so much. So um, you've done a service tonight. Okay. Thank you. And uh, feel free to reach out to if I can be of any help. Thank you. Thanks, thanks again for all you do for the Alliance. Incredible work. You're, well, thank you for all you do for our patients. All right. Good night, everyone. Go join the, the support group. They got started up already. Click the link in the chat. I'll leave it up for just a second or two, and then I have to have to turn the webinar off. But thank you and, and good night. Thanks. Bye-bye.